Crime Feast. True Crime Stories. The city of Glasgow has seen its fair share of thugs and gangsters over the years, but most residents would only hear about these guys in the paper every so often. After all, too much attention wasn't exactly good for business for anyone involved in criminal activities. Of course, every now and then, an internal beef or war would break out with different gangs or deals would go bad. Someone would get ripped off and the blood would spill onto the streets into public view. But this was pretty rare in general, the underworld was not part of everyday life for most people. Today, however, this is far from the case. The guys who run things now don't follow the same code that most used to live by. Now there is no attempt to shield the public from what goes on, from high speed pursuits to gangland shootings at schools, the streets of Glasgow have become a war zone. The two main players at the center of this war are the Lions Clan and the Daniel Clan. Two families who have been rivals for decades, but who are they? And who sits at the head of tables today? Eddie Lyons was the original head of the Lions Clan. Back in 1992, Eddie opened a community project center in the disused Chernside School in Milton. It was, however, run as a type of headquarters for their criminal empire. Eddie Lyons seemed to be untouchable with connections everywhere. The police kept their distance, and he was even given £1.4 million in government funding for his community project. The Daniels brothers started their criminal lifestyle by terrorizing Possel Park. They went from shoplifting, loan sharking, and stealing scrap metal to dealing in drugs, stolen cars, and smuggling drugs. Jamie Daniels, who ran the clan, owned a scrapyard and bought and sold cars when he, along with his brothers, moved into the drug game and quickly became a major player. They were well known for using violence to protect their growing syndicate. They flew under the radar for quite some due to their fondness of using counterintelligence methods, that was how they quickly became Scotland's richest gangsters. There were always going to be problems with two big time players in the drugs game in such close proximity, and there have been so many incidents between the rivals it would be impossible to list them all. I don't think anyone could have ever predicted the tit for tat would lead to a war that's still raging on today. More than 20 years after it began. One of the major events that started this feud was in the summer of 2001 when a Daniel drug flat was robbed of a large amount of cocaine. The drugs were sold on to members of the Lions who were angry that the Daniels had been dealing in what they considered was their turf. This started the violent hits back and forth. Then in 2006, another major event escalated the war. Stephen Lyons, One of Eddie's sons, and who had started to take over as leader of the clan, arrived at his uncle David's garage accompanied by Robert Piggy Pickett, a senior and trusted enforcer of the Lions. When the pair pulled up to Apple Row Motors, David and his son Mark, who worked at the garage, were there, with another of Stephen's cousins, Michael Lyons. Just then, a blue Mazda had stopped across the road, and two men got out, both wearing long black coats and both had masks on. The men walked quickly up to the garage. And then each pulled a handgun out and opened fire. Stephen, who was still in the car with Pickett, was shot in the back through the rear windscreen. He attempted to drive off, but with no way out, he got out of the car to try and take cover inside. But before he could, another bullet struck his leg. He later said, When the bullet hit, it snapped my leg and I just fell. Pickett also jumped out of the car, but as he did, he realized one of the gunmen was just a couple of feet away. The next thing Pickett knew was pain as a bullet hit his stomach. Meanwhile, David Lyons saw the men approach. Then, as the shooting started, he heard Michael scream and saw him fall. He said, As I went back to get him up, I saw the gunman coming towards us, so I had to drop him and I just ran. When the shooting stopped, the two men ran back to the Mazda and screeched away in a hurry. David returned to his nephew but knew immediately there was no hope. Later, saying that he had no color left in him, it is not known and probably never will be. Whether the two shooters were there for Stephen or maybe they were after his dad Eddie Sr., who was supposed to be at the garage also but was running late. One thing that's a certainty is they wanted blood, and if it was Lyons' blood they were after, they certainly got their wish. The aftermath of the garage shooting had left Stephen Lyons in a leg cast for a number of weeks. Pickett later revealed that he was in a coma for a week and lost a kidney, and of course, Michael, at 21 years old, had lost his life. Leaving his family undoubtedly heartbroken and angry. Among that family were his mother, his 18 year old sister, his fiancee, and his 11 month old daughter. 
The blue Mazda was found two days later not far from the garage it had been abandoned. Then ten days after the shooting incident David Lyons received a ransom note. It read, The boys owe me £25,000 and I want what's owed to me. It's for drugs. They all know what it's about. The money doesn't matter to me as it's got to be paid to the piper. I don't want the police, the boys, not even your wife, knowing about it. If you keep them out of this then all your lives can go back to normal as we are all losing money through this. If you have any tricks for my pickup man then all the deals are off. Remember to keep your mouth shut. No cameras, no surveillance, as the pickup man doesn't know nothing so he's no use to you. Drop off, 4 p.m. Saturday. I'll draw you a map and X will mark the spot. David did not pay the money instead he handed the note to the police. Police started their investigations which included quite a long surveillance operation. Then in March 2007 two men were arrested and charged for the murder of Michael Lyons and the attempted murder of Stephen Lyons and Robert Pickett. Raymond Anderson and James McDonald, both associates of the Daniels were the men police believed to be trigger men. Their trial started in March 2008. The men had been business associates for a number of years. Anderson had been employed by McDonald to buy and repair cars. Both pleaded not guilty and the trial began. The prosecution brought forward a witness from that day at Apple Row Motors. She was a 15-year-old schoolgirl who had been driving past the garage at the time of the shooting. She stated that she had seen two men run from the garage and jump into the blue Mazda and took off behind her mother's car. The car then turned left down Scursa Street and out of view. At an identity parade after the shooting, the 15-year-old had picked out McDonald. Stephen Lyons was called to give evidence and said as he sat in the car with Pickett he saw, two guys with masks next thing I heard was gunshots. I could not see where the shots were coming from. I then sped away in my car towards the side of the building. The window went in so obviously the car was being shot at. Stephen who had gone to the garage to meet his cousin Michael said he almost hit his other cousin Mark when trying to flee causing him to swerve into a fence, then he said he got out and ran inside the building to get away from the bullets by hiding behind a car, but then he said, one of the guys must have shot at me because I got hit in the leg, I couldn't see him firing at me because it hit me from the side, it snapped my leg and I just fell. That was it, that was the last shot as far as I can remember. The jury was told that Stephen Lyons who described himself as a business contractor had a cast on his leg for 12 weeks due to his broken leg. He also needed to have a piece of the bullet removed from his back. When further questioned about the gunman he simply said, all I know is they had masks on. Next, the jury was played recordings from the taped conversations the police had obtained during their surveillance. In these conversations both Anderson and McDonald were heard calling themselves the untouchables and speaking of the piper that was referred to in the ransom note. Anderson claimed to have nothing to do with it and said the piper they spoke of was about a previous unrelated case. Time for the jury's vote and they were unanimous in their verdict of guilty of being in possession of illegal guns and ammunition, and for the attempted murder of Stephen Lyons and Robert Pickett, and for the murder of Michael Lyons. Judge Lord Hardy sentenced both men to life with a minimum of 35 years before they could even be considered for parole. This was the highest ever set in a Scottish court. The hearing took place in courtroom 3 which was designed for terrorist trials. The police security was majorly increased for this trial also. During the last week no less than 10 officers stood directly outside the courtroom and a further 7 at the court main entrance behind the large walk-through metal detector. Lord Hardy's last words to the pair were, the murder of Michael Lyons was a cold-blooded premeditated assassination and will not be tolerated in our civilized society. Law-abiding citizens are entitled to expect courts to remove you from society to afford them and their families protection from criminals like you. This will not occur unless the public cooperates with the police in removing guns and gangsters from the streets. The shooting is believed to have been a retaliation for an attempted hit on a high-ranking Daniels member weeks before. Kevin, the gerbil, Carol, was shot in a drive-by shooting. This was the second time Carol had been shot. The first was at his mother's front door. The attacks on Carol are thought to be a retaliation for Carol vandalizing the grave of Eddie Lyon's son who had died of leukemia. However, Carol wasn't only a high-ranking enforcer for the Daniels, He was also the partner of Kelly Green, 
the daughter of Jamie Daniels the mob boss and head man for the Daniels. This made Carol part of the family. He was shot in the stomach. Another of the Daniels associates Ross Sherlock was hit in the legs. Both survived without any lasting injuries. Stephen Lyons who was now considered head of the Lyons crime family decided to go underground after the shooting and after learning about a £200,000 hit on his head. He is believed to have been in Dubai for a time before heading to Spain. During this time he is alleged to have formed an alliance with the Kinahan family from Dublin believed to be the most powerful cartel in Europe. The tit-for-tat violence continued with slashings, stabbings, and shootings coming from both sides. Then in January 2010 another major event in this war occurred. Kevin Carroll had summoned a local dealer for a meeting in the car park of an Asda in Glasgow. After the meeting as Carroll sat in the back seat of a three-door Audi a black Volkswagen Golf stopped in front of the Audi and two men got out and started shooting into the car. There were two of Carroll's friends in the car at the time John Bonner and Stephen McLagan had both ran when the car stopped in front of them leaving Carroll alone in the car with no way out. It was the third time unlucky for the gerbil, as this time he was shot in the head and body and died right there. Carroll was well known by most in the drug world for his erratic behavior and extreme violence. One of the methods used regularly by Carroll and his men were abductions. These abductions became known as alien abductions due to the fact that the men abducted would often be found wandering the streets in a state of undress and with no recollection of what had happened. Carroll would take his captors to abandoned and disused buildings where they would likely be tied up and tortured for days. The police had Carroll on their radar for quite some time as one of the most dangerous criminals in Scotland. A source close to the Daniels said that clan boss Jamie was furious about the murder. He had thought that he had already won the war against the Lions with clan boss Stephen abroad. But now he knew and he was not happy. It said that Jamie called a meeting with his men and demanded payback. He wanted the shooters and anyone else involved found before the police got to them. Not long after Carroll's death, the police seized the £217,000 villa where his partner and kids were still living under the Proceeds of Crime Act. In 2012 the police decided to charge two men with Kevin Carroll's murder, Ross Monaghan and Billy, Buff, Patterson. However, Patterson had fled to Spain and was believed to be with crime boss Stephen Lyons. This left Monaghan to face trial alone. The case however collapsed as there was no physical evidence to link Monaghan to the crime scene so he walked free. So this left the tensions at an all-time high between the warring clans and the blood continued to spill on both sides with more stabbings and attacks. In 2015 Billy Patterson decided to return to Scotland and face trial, perhaps assuming that he to, would be cleared of the murder and walk free. This however wasn't the case and he was sentenced to a minimum of 22 years in prison for the murder. A year later in 2016 Jamie Daniels the notorious and ruthless crime boss of the Daniels passed away after a fight with cancer. This left everyone not knowing what would happen next as the boss who some considered a bit of a control freak made no plans for anyone to take over once he had gone. The most likely next in line would have been his son Xander Sutherland but he had the previous year been sentenced to 13 and a half years in a major heroin dealing operation busted by police. The crown instead went to Jamie's nephew Stephen, Bonzo. Daniels who it is believed ordered a hit on Ross Monaghan. Perhaps to show the Daniels were still as ruthless and present as they ever were. However, the hit failed, a lone gunman pushing an empty buggy to conceal the rifle he was about to use, opened fire on Monaghan as he dropped his daughter off at primary school in the Pennelly area of the city. One bullet did hit its target before the shooter fled the scene. Ross Monaghan was well enough though to drive himself to the hospital. Later that night he was on a plane to join Lyons boss Stephen in Spain. A Daniels associate Martin Fitzsimmons was locked up for the primary school shooting. The retaliation from members of the Lions mob was beyond anything anyone could have imagined. Six members of the Lions clan hatched a murderous plan. This wasn't just a case of let's try hit these guys. No this was a very well planned series of attacks involving tracking devices, encrypted mobile phones, and signal blocking devices. The six men who planned and carried out this series of attacks were Brian Ferguson, Andrew Gallacher, Andrew Sinclair, John Hardy, Peter Bain, and Robert Pickett.
Pickett was one of the men shot in the 2006 shooting that left Michael Lyons dead. The Lyons hitmen had five targets. First, they went after Robert Daniels, as he was driving alone through Robroyston his car was rammed from the side hitting his driver's side door, Daniel jumped out of his car and ran into a nearby flat, as he turned to see if he was being chased he only saw the silver of the weapon coming towards him, he could not make out what the weapon was but said it was a heavy bladed weapon like an axe or machete, he was also unsure how many attackers there were, luckily he was able to make it to the hospital where he received stitches to the head. Thomas Byland was next, after a trip to the local shop he returned to his mother's house, just as he walked towards the front door he felt a blow from behind. Next thing he knew he was on the ground six and there were four masked men one attacker was hitting him with a hatchet type weapon and another must have had a blade as he was also stabbed. Somehow he managed to get back to his feet and ran to a nearby kebab shop to call an ambulance. The attack left him with a stab wound and a fractured skull among other injuries. Third on the hit list was Gary Petty who was tracked to Maryhill where he was surrounded by a group of men with weapons including a machete and baton. Next up was Ryan Fitzsimmons the brother of Daniel's hitman Martin Fitzsimmons and the only one who had no connection to either gang and no involvement in any criminal activities. He was targeted to send a message to his brother. Ryan was surrounded by six men outside the home he shared with his mother. He remembered that he had no way out and he just curled up and waited for death. His mother ran outside as the attackers fled the scene. The brutality of the attack had left her son's head cracked open like an egg. It was in fact so horrific she had a heart attack right there on the spot. She recovered but her son Ryan was left with permanent brain damage meaning he will never again be able to live alone without care. Last in the list was the new head man Stephen Bonzo Daniels. They had somehow managed to install a tracking device on Daniel's Skoda and as he traveled home a black Audi and black Golf appeared. Daniels realized they were following him and tried to lose them resulting in a hundred mile an hour chase through the streets of Glasgow. Then Daniels tried to slip onto the motorway going in the wrong direction, but as he got to the off ramp to the M8 motorway he was hit by one of the chasing cars and all he remembered after that, was seeing his car hurling towards a pole. It is probably very lucky that he has no memory of the attack that followed. The occupants of both cars piled out with weapons and launched an attack so vicious that Daniel's face has been left unrecognizable and grotesquely disfigured. The six men behind the attacks were sentenced to a total of 104 years behind bars. If anyone thought that this would end or even slow down the attacks they would be very wrong indeed. The war continues both on the streets and behind bars with countless stabbings, slashings and attacks coming from both sides. This feud seems to be far from over. Who knows when and how the next attack will happen but for the residents of Glasgow the violence could happen at any time and no place is off limits anymore. Crime Feast True Crime Stories